We have already noted in the general introduction to NX6 that EU OPS, or more specifically, NX3 to Council Regulation 3.9.2.2 of 1991, is the document whereby EASA demonstrates compliance with the standards of Annex 6 Part 1, Commercial Air Transportation in Aeroplanes. At this time, that is the time of writing, the aviation regulations of the European Union are in transition from the JAA to EASA. However, as far as commercial air transportation is concerned, EASA is the regulatory authority and EU OPS the regulatory document. Any operator of aeroplanes for commercial air transportation whose principal place of business is in a member state of the EU must comply, therefore, with EU OPS. Within the document, EU OPS refers to itself as OPS Part 1. Here are the applicable topics contained within EU OPS. To remind yourself of the regulatory areas. We will use the same method in this group of lessons, European Requirements, as we did in Global Requirements, that is, show the actual wording of EU OPS on the screen. Remember to avoid reading this text during the narration, as this may confuse you. OPS 1, EU OPS, does not apply to aeroplanes when used for military, customs and police services, nor parachute dropping and firefighting flights, nor aerial work flights with no more than six essential staff other than crew members. We have just heard the term aerial work, but what does this mean? To explain, we must examine the definitions of the three types of aircraft operation, namely aerial work, commercial air transport and general aviation. Aerial work is basically any paid work involving an aircraft other than transporting passengers, mail or cargo. Spraying forest fires, flight instruction and fisheries protection are all examples of aerial work. Commercial air transport is what we would recognise as an airline operation, but also includes the work of Cargo Lux, FedEx and the US Postal Service. In other words, it is the paid transportation by air of passengers, mail or cargo. General aviation is everything else and is essentially unpaid. Costs may be shared between friends or charged to a charity organisation. However, the pilot must not profit from his airborne activities. Here are the Annex 6 definitions of aerial work commercial air transport and general aviation. As you will gather from the title, the main thrust of this lesson is operator certification and responsibilities. However, before we investigate the Air Operator Certificate AOC, we will examine a few general rules of operation. As far as the operation is concerned, if it is to be commercial air transportation, it must be in accordance with EU OPS, that is, OPS Part 1. The aeroplanes must comply with the following. Any retroactive airworthiness requirements, the terms of the Certificate of Airworthiness and the limitations of the aeroplane flight manual. The synthetic training devices that is, flight simulators or flight training devices, if they are used to replace the actual aeroplane for training or checking, must be qualified for the task and approved by EASA, usually through the appropriate National Aviation Authority. This ends our investigation of the general rules of operation. Now we will move to the details of air operator certification and the responsibilities of the operator. In this section, we will examine air operator certification, 
in terms of rules, issuance, contents and conditions. Each operator subject to EU OPS is required to obtain an Air Operator Certificate AOC, and to comply with the terms and conditions under which it is issued. Obviously, EASA wants to protect the travelling public by ensuring the operation is safe and well managed. Initially, this is achieved through the application and inspection process. The applicant for an AOC must allow EASA to examine his operation, its organisation, maintenance method, etc. To satisfy EASA, he is able to conduct it safely. This includes the safety oversight of aeroplanes not registered in the same state as the operation, that is, the state of the operator. Often here, we are discussing aeroplanes leased in to the operation. We will examine the different types of lease towards the end of this lesson. The operator must satisfy EASA that the operation is suitably and properly managed and supervised, including through the appointment of a number of post holders. One manager, the accountable manager, is ultimately responsible for the operation in terms of operational standards and their appropriate financing. This person will probably be the Chief Executive Officer. Here are the operator's responsibilities with respect to organisation, management and supervision. The authority ultimately means EASA, but includes the National Aviation Authority and the state of the operator. For example, the LBA of Germany or the UK Civil Aviation Authority, the CAA. Click on the Continue button when you are ready to proceed. The documentary basis for the operation is the Operations Manual. Study of this document will be extensive and the subject of a future lesson. Here is a further list of operator responsibilities with respect to Air Operator Certification. In order to gain further insight into the nature of Air Operator Certification, we will now examine the certificate itself. The Air Operator Certificate specifies the name and address of the operator, the date of issue of the certificate and its period of validity, the type of authorised operations, Types of aeroplane authorised for use and their registration markings. The authorised areas of operation. Any special limitations. And any special authorisations or approvals. For example, low visibility operations. Extended range operations in twin-engined aeroplanes. The transportation of dangerous goods, etc. This ends our examination of the certificate. There are several conditions an air operator must satisfy before he will be issued an air operator certificate, or if he requires a variation to be made to it, or if he wishes to maintain its validity. Firstly, all of the aeroplanes must have and maintain a standard certificate of airworthiness. Secondly, the maintenance system for the aeroplanes must be approved by EASA. Thirdly, he must satisfy EASA, or more likely the National Aviation Authority, that he has the ability to meet the following requirements, including compliance with OPS 1.175. We have already examined this article, that is, OPS 1.175 which deals with safety, organisation and management, plus equipment and support. If you wish to remind yourself of this information, please use the Quick Navigation tool to revisit Operator Certification. We have learned that the operator is required to establish and maintain both a Quality Management System, QMS, 
and also a safety management system, SMS. Our next two articles for study deal with the specific requirements of these systems. Firstly, the quality management system. Owing to the complexity and highly technical nature of an airline, this system is often split into two parts within a quality management unit, namely operations and maintenance. Each part is the remit of an appointed quality manager. The system itself must be established, documented and assure compliance with relevant regulations, standards and procedures. In addition, both the system and the manager or managers must be EASA approved. Second, we found from Annex 6 that an accident prevention and flight safety program was required, which for aeroplanes over 27 tonnes included a flight data monitoring system. We examined the basis system constructed by British Airways. OPS 1.037 allows the SMS to be integrated with the quality system. It also provides more details, that is, the requirements to maintain risk awareness, report occurrences, and appoint an individual to manage the programme. The obvious occurrence is an accident, but an occurrence also includes anything that compromises or could have compromised flight safety, i.e. an incident. The individual, often called the flight safety officer or manager, is to be responsible for proposing any corrective actions identified by the SMS. In smaller airlines, this individual will probably be the quality manager, operations. Indeed, the quality manager has a defined role here, that is, to assess the effectiveness of corrective actions identified by the SMS. The ICAO standard for a safety management system appeared only recently. It is highly topical and should you wish to find out more about the SMS, download for free the Safety Management Manual, DOC 9859, from ICAO's website. Here we will end our discussion of quality and safety management systems. The last few articles to end this lesson are the language rules for crew members, ditching requirements and leasing regulations. First, the language requirement. Within the EU, a citizen of any member state may work for any EU airline. Consequently, the operator is not only required to ensure that all crew can communicate in a common language, but also that all operations personnel can understand the language of applicable sections of the operations manual. Second, the ditching requirements. Ditching is when a land aeroplane has to make an emergency landing on water. We probably all remember the US Airways Airbus 320, which was ditched in the Hudson River. Captain Sullenberger's cool and methodical approach to the double engine failure over New York is a lesson in professionalism to us all. The EU Ops requirements are specific to aeroplanes with approved seating for more than 30. These aeroplanes must only be operated on overwater flights when either they comply with the ditching requirements of the appropriate airworthiness code or they will remain within two hours at cruising speed or 400 nautical miles, whichever is the lesser, of land suitable for making an emergency landing. Finally, leasing. Many airlines either lease in or lease out aeroplanes. Depending upon whose AOC the aeroplane is lodged, the lease is termed dry or wet. If an airline, the lessee, leases in an aeroplane that will be added to its AOC, the contract is called a dry lease. If, however, the aeroplane remains on the AOC of the lessor, that is, the owner who is leasing out, the lease is termed wet. The requirements for leasing then depend upon whether the lessors, lessees, are in EU member states or not.
If the lease is between community members, then EASA approval must be sought and the transaction will be considered to be variations of the appropriate AOCs. For example, if Lufthansa dry lease in a 737 from Air France KLM, Lufthansa's AOC would have to be varied to include operation of that 737. Similarly, Air France KLM's AOC would be varied to show the removal of operational control of that 737. However, should the lease be a wet lease out involving the lease of the aeroplane, a complete crew and effectively the AOC, the lessor will remain as the operator and thereby responsible for the operational control of the aeroplane. In this case, therefore, it doesn't matter whether or not the lessee is in an EU member state. This arrangement often occurs between airlines and travel companies. The travel company will want exclusive use of the aeroplane for a period, usually the summer, without itself having to become an airline. There are different rules and terminology applicable when leasing between an EASA operator and a non-EASA organization. First the dry lease in. For example, if Lufthansa leased in a 757 from United, the lease must be approved with particular regard to any instrument, communications or navigation equipment differences from the EU Ops requirements. The approval requirements are, of course, more extensive for the wet lease in. Here, the whole of the lessor's operation comes under scrutiny, especially the airworthiness of the aeroplanes and their operational control. Finally, the dry lease out. Here, EASA wishes to ensure the aeroplane appears on the lessee's AOC, but in order to ensure that upon return to the lessor, the aeroplane is airworthy, EASA requires the lessee's maintenance program to be approved. Here are the requirements in full, along with the end of this lesson on the regulations for air operator certification through EU Ops.